Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and maths tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. All right, so today we're going to be doing AQAA level chemistry, paper three from June 2021. This question is about the ethane dioic acid and the ethane dioic ion. Ethane dioic acid reacts with pro propane 1,3-diol to form a polyester. Draw the repeating unit of this polyester. Right. So whenever you're doing organic questions, you need to think about your big synthetic pathway and what can do what. This is a carboxylic acid. It's a molecule with two carboxylic acid groups, and this is a molecule with two alcohol groups. Alcohols and carboxylic acids can react to form esters, and di, you know, di dicarboxylic acids and diols can react to form polyesters. And the reaction formation is still the same thing. It's still a condensation reaction where a molecule of water is released. So to draw the repeating unit, you draw your um, your uh, your carboxylic acid. So okay, I'll I'll take you through the steps as a whole. Okay, so you've got your original carboxylic acid here. So C double bond O double bond O O H O H. That's your ethane dioic acid. We've got propane one three diol. So that's one two three. It's propane one three. So it's O H here and then H O here and then we've got H H H H H H H and H. When you're forming an ester link like this, you're losing the OH from the carboxylic acid and an H from the alcohol, and a link forms like that. So on the, because, because they want you to draw the repeating unit, we're also going to lose this OH here, and we're going to lose that H there as well, and we're going to draw tailing off bonds like that. So what you end up with is this. Well, we ignore the massively draw, drawn line, but there you go. There you go. And there you go. It's really important that to be able to recognize what groups you've got going on and what reactions they can do. If you see a C double bond O, O, and then C like this, that's probably an ester link. So it could suggest a polyester, it can suggest an ester. So it's really helpful to see things in terms of the groups that are available. Explain why polyesters are biodegradable, but polyalkenes are not biodegradable. So in polyalkenes, all you've got is you've got, you've got CH, CC bonds, right? In polyesters, you've got um, you've got C double bond O bonds or C O bonds, and they're polar. So in polyesters, there are C O and C double bond O bonds, and these are polar. Now this is important because they are polar. This carbon's slightly more positive because the electrons are more close to to the oxygen. They're pulled towards it because they have differences in electronegativity meaning that this, they are susceptible to a um, nucleophilic attack. So susceptible to nucleophilic attack. Or you could say they can be hydrolyzed. So I've talked about polyesters. We need to talk about polyalkenes. So the bonds in polyalkenes are nonpolar. Sodium ethane dioate is used to find the concentration of the solutions of potassium manganate by titration, and the equation is as follows. A standard solution is made by dissolving 162 milligrams of Na2C204 with an MR of this in water and making up to 250 centimeters cubed in a volumetric flask. 25 centimeters cubed of this solution and an excess of sulfuric acid are added to a conical flask. The mixture is warmed and titrated with potassium manganate solution. The titration is repeated until concordant results are obtained, and the mean titer is 23.85 centimeters cubed. Calculate the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of the potassium, uh, sorry, potassium manganate solution. These questions are always really lengthy and describes like 2 million different processes. If you understand what's going on step by step, then it makes a lot more sense. So what they've done is they've dissolved Na2CO3 in a standard solution, and they've taken out 25 centimeter cubed samples. Put it in a conical flask, and they, they're titrating it against um, potassium manganates. The potassium manganates in here, they're sitting there and dripping it into this conical flask here. So, so we've got a volume of the potassium manganate solution, but we want to find out its concentration. So to do that, you need its, you need its moles. So in order to do that, we're going to have to use reaction stoichiometry, which is basically using the molar ratios and stuff like that, right? They've told us that we've got this mass of Na2C, uh, sorry, Na2C204 with an MRF 34 in the 250 centimeter cube sample. So we can start by working out the moles of Na2C2O4, which is going to be 0 0.162 divided by um, 134. Now I did 0 0.162 because this is in milligrams and this only works in grams. This gives you 0 0.00121 moles. 
Okay, so the problem is, is that these are the number of moles in 250 centimeters cubed. We've used a tenth of that in the 25 centimeters cubed, so we're going to divide this by 10. So the moles of Na2C2O4 in 25 centimeters cubed equals 0 0.00121 divided by 10, which is 1.21 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. Therefore, the moles of MnO4 minus is going to be this, this number divided by 5 and then times by 2. And times by 2. Which gives us 4.84 times 10 to the minus 5 moles. Now we have the moles of the manganate solution that was that was reacted and we have its volume we can work out its concentration so c equals n over v which would be 4.84 times 10 to the minus 5 divided by the volume which was its mean titer of 23.85 divided by 1000 and that equals 2.029 times 10 to the minus 3 mole per decimeter cubed which in this case roughly becomes uh, 2.03 times 10 to the minus 3 mole per decimeter cubed. Figure 1 shows the 25 centimeter cubed pipette to, used to measure the sodium F and di solution. On figure 1, draw the meniscus of the solution when the pipette is ready to transfer 25 centimeters cubed of the sodium F and di solution. So all you do is you draw the meniscus touching the graduation mark like this. Obviously, my pen's a bit thick, but you want the bottom of the meniscus to touch that. It's a meniscus that's curved and the bottom touches that line. Potassium manganate is oxidizing and harmful. Sodium ethylene dioate is toxic. Suggest safety procedures other than eye protection that should be taken when filling the burette with potassium manganate solution and dissolving the solid sodium ethylene dioate in water. So when, we, when it comes to filling the burette, it's probably wise to fill it either below you or at eye level. If you're filling it above and you spill it, it goes straight into your eyes. Also, I don't know who would do that. So fill at eye level or at least below you. Dissolving the solid. Well, you know, wear gloves. State the color change seen at the end point of each titration. So we're talking about what you see in the conical flask. So the sodium ethyl dioate solution is in the conical flask, which is colorless, and you're adding potassium manganate, and the reaction happens when you get 2M and 2 plus. So it goes in the conical flask, it goes from colorless to whatever color MN2 plus is, which is pink. Figure 2 shows the burette containing potassium manganate solution. Give two practical steps needed before recording the initial burette reading. So, I mean, first of all, you need to remove the funnel. The reason being is because there might be liquid still in this that drips into it and messes up your results. And as well as that, ensure there's no air bubbles below the tap. Or, like, say something like ensure the jet is filled, it has no air bubbles, or allows um, open the tap to fill the space below. When Na2C2O4 aqueous is added to a solution containing FeH206 ions, a reaction happens in which all six water ligands are replaced by ethane dioate ions. Explain why the replacement of the water ligands by ethane dioate ions is favorable and the answer referred to enthalpy and entropy changes for the reaction. How the enthalpy and entropy changes influence the free energy change for the reaction. So in terms of enthalpy changes, we need to think about what delta H is like. So delta H is dependent on the making and breaking of bonds. So making bonds is exothermic because energy is released, and breaking bonds is endothermic because you have to, you know, put energy in to break the bonds. Now, we're breaking all of these coordinate bonds, but forming the same number of coordinate bonds. So delta H is probably going to be similar. So delta H is similar as we break and make the same number and type of bonds, because we're going from four water ligands and the coordinate bonds between the oxygen to Na2C2O4, and it's also still forming a coordinate bond with the oxygen. So they, they which may have, sorry, the same enthalpies. Now we need to talk about the entropy change. So if you think about it, we've got Fe with six H2Os. Now we're going to have Fe with um, three C2O4, two minuses. That's a lot more atoms. You've got this and this rather than just H2O. So the entropy increases. So delta S 
is positive and entropy increases. Why? Because we're going from as more particles, sorry, are introduced. So now we need to talk about the impact it has on delta G. So start by writing the equation out and then talk about all the different pieces and what happens. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So if delta H is like, you know, neg it's the same, there's not really much enthalpy change because the bond enthalpies are the same. Um, this is like near zero. There's like nothing going on here. So we've got negative T delta S here. Now you can't have a negative temperature and the entropy change is positive. So that must mean that delta G is always negative. So delta G is always negative as the minus T delta S part is always negative and delta H is negligible. Therefore, the reaction is always feasible as delta G is less than zero. A protein fibrin can be broken down by using uh, into amino acids using an enzyme. The student uses TLC to identify these amino acids. The student identifies two of the amino acids as alanine and serine. Using figure three to calculate the RF value of the unknown amino acid to show you working on them. Use your RF value to identify the unknown acid. So to work it out, all you do is you put the distance that your thing traveled, so distance traveled from origin over the solvent front. Right, so you would measure from here to here, and that gives you a solvent front, and then from here to whichever point it was, which is here. So if you do that, you get an RF value of 0 0.34. You guys can measure it. I'm just going to go with what Mark's scheme says because the scaling's different. And the identity, according to that, is glycine. The amino acids cannot be seen as they move during the experiment. State how the amino acids can be made visible at the end of the experiment. Well, you could just use a fluorescent dye and UV light. I think the dye is called ninhydrin. State why each amino acid has a different RF value. So when you're having chromatography, what happens is you've got your stationary phase, which is the plate, and then you've got the mobile phase, which is like the you know, solution that moves across it. So how I like to think of it is that you've got this stuck to it, it's adsorbed to the plate, and then it goes into the mobile phase, and then it sticks again, and it keeps doing this over and over again. So if you've got something that has a high affinity to the plate, it's going to stay stuck to the plate for longer. Whereas if you've got something that's a high affinity to the mobile phase, it will just keep going like that, and boom you know, it gets to the end sooner, so it travels further. So th that's how I like to think of it making sense. So the two factors that determine that is their affinity or their attraction or solubility to the stationary and mobile phases. So each amino acid has a different affinity to the mobile and stationary phases. This question is about ketones. Solution X reacts with liquid ketones to form a crystalline solid. This reaction could be used to identify a ketone if the crystalline solid is separated, repurified by crystal recrystallization, and the melting point determined. Describe how the crystalline solid is separated and purified. Let's say we have this here. So I mean, let's say the square is the product we want and the circle is the impurities, right? If we choose a solution in which it dissolves where it's hot, we can dissolve it in the solution, filter it out, so we're left with only the impurities. And then, you know, in the little uh, watch glass, we've got all of the dissolved, you know, squares that we want, the pure stuff. As it cools out, these are going to crystallize and come out of the solution because they're less soluble in the solution, and then you can just wash with water. So that's what you want to do with organic um, substances, like solids, sorry. If you're using liquids, then you need to do a separating funnel, but with solids, you need to do this. So what you would do is you would dissolve in a minimal amount of hot solvent and filter, then cool to crystallize and filter under reduced pressure. We want to get rid of the solvent, remember, so that's important. And it also gets rid of other like um, impurities that we might not want. And also as well as that, we need to wash with cold water. 
And you do that while filtering under reduced pressure. So the marks come from one for filtering, one for dissolving in the minimum volume, one for hot solution, one for cooling and filtering under reduced pressure, and then one for washing with cold, cold solvent. Propanone reacts with a weak acid HCN to form a hydroxynitrile. This hydroxynitrile is usually made by a reaction of propanone with KCN followed by dilute acid instead of HCN. State the hazard associated with the use of KCN and suggest why a reason other than safety why KCN is used instead of HCN. So, I mean, obviously, um, well, I mean, the hazard is that it's toxic and yeah. So why do we use KCN instead of um, HCN? It's because KCN fully dissociates and it gives you more of that nucleophile. So KCN dissociates more than HCN. Outline the mechanism for the reaction of propanone with KCN followed by dilute acid. So this happens via a nucleophilic addition reaction. So what happens is, so I'll draw, I'll just draw out the, um, the propanone first. So we've got propanone here. So we've got a C double bond O, CH3, H3C here, right? So the cyanide ion is CN minus. And what happens is, again, because this is a, this is a nuclear, this is the nucleophile. This carbon is slightly positive compared to the negative because the negative oxygen, because the electronegativity of oxygen is higher than carbon. So what happens is, Potassium cyanide dissociates into K plus and CN minus. The CN minus attacks the partially positive carbon atom and it donates a pair of electrons, hence acting as a nucleophile, forming a bond with the carbon. So the CN minus does this. Now carbon can only have four bonds, so one of these things has to go. So what happens is, is that the um, a bond from the bond here breaks and some of the, ele the electron a pair of electrons sorry goes to that oxygen. So now you've got this intermediate where you have H3C, C, C, H3, C, N. We've got O minus with two, with a lone pair of electrons. Now, what happens is the lone pair of electrons, so the bond, the oxygen bonds to an H plus ion from the dilute acid, and that forms the hydroxyl group. That forms the OH part. So you've got an H plus here and a bond form, so these are electrons go like that. And then what you're left with is H3, C, 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 H3, C, N. And then you've got your OH here. So that is your hydroxy nitrile. So hydroxy, OH, and then nitrile, C triple bond end. This question is about group seven chemistry. Give an equation for the reaction of sodium, sodium, bromine, to concentrate sulfuric acid to form bromine, and state one observation during this. Okay, so what you have is you've got H2SO4 plus NaBr, because these are those reactions where you've got like H2SO4 and, and all that kind of stuff reacting with um, group seven salts. And then what happens is you've got Na2SO4 plus SO2 plus bromine itself plus the water, sorry, plus H2O. It's just one of those things where you kind of have to memorize the equations. Unfortunately, there's no way around it. You just kind of have to, yeah, memorize it. So what's an observation where you form an orange solution or, you know, an orange brown solution? So orange solution forms. Okay, a solution that's thought to contain chloride ions and iodine, iodide ions is tested. Dilute nitric acid is added. Aqueous silver nitrate is added. A pale yellow precipitate forms excess. Aqueous ammonia is added. Some of the precipitate dissolves and a darker yellow precipitate remains. Give a reason for each of the use of the catalyst. Explain the observations and give ionic equations for each reactant. Fine. Okay, so the reason they add HNO3 is to remove carbonate ions, which can form white precipitates with AgNO3 it could form false positives, so we don't want that. Next, the AgNO3 forms a white precipitate with chloride ions and a yellow precipitate with iodide ions, right? So that's probably why it's gone pale yellow. And the equations for these is you've got Ag plus aqueous from the AgNO3 that dissociates into it, plus Cl minus aqueous goes to AgCl solid. That's the precipitate. And then the same for this, Ag plus aqueous plus I minus instead aqueous goes to AgI, and that's a solid. Now we need to talk about the ammonia. So the um, excess dilute NH3 dissolves AgCl and leaves behind AGI. That's why it gives that's why it goes yellow. 
And then the equation for this is you've got AgCl solid plus NH3 goes to Ag NH3 2 plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. And to balance that, you need a 2 there. So just as a quick summary with your, um, your halide ions and stuff, you've got your halide here. You've got your precipitate color here with, N with Ag NO3. And then the, you've got um, adding dilute NH3 and then adding concentrated NH3. That should be excess, sorry. So the halide Cl minus, Br minus, and I minus, right? And these are all aqueous. So if you add silver nitrate, this forms a white precipitate, this forms a cream precipitate, and this one forms a yellow precipitate. And then if you add dilute NH3 um, to C the AgCl, um, it dissolves, but nothing happens here and nothing happens here. Whereas if you add concentrated um, ammonia, then this dissolves and this dissolves, but nothing happens to AgI. And that's how you do that. A mixture of methanoic acid and sodium methanoic in aqueous solution acts as an acidic buffer solution, and the equation is as follows. Calculate the mass of gra in grams of sodium methanoid that must be added to 25 centimeters cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed methanoic acid to produce a buffer solution of the pH of that. And for this acid, the pKa is that. Get, assume the volume of this solution raised constant. So off the bat, we need to figure out how much sodium methanoate we need to add because that all dissociates into A minus. If you watch my acids and bases videos, this, this would make a lot more sense. Go and check it out if you haven't. So the A minus is the HCO minus, and you can see that that's here. So all of the sodium methanoate dissociates into this, and that gives you that A minus. So we need to use Ka to find A minus, basically, and then work backwards. So first of all, we need to work out what Ka is. So Ka would be 10 to the minus 3.75, because that's pKa. So to go backwards, we do that, and that'd be 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeter cube. Now we need to work out H plus. So they want a pH of 4.05. So our concentration of H plus is going to be um, 10 to the minus 4.05, which is 8.91 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeter cubed. Right, so now Ka equals H plus A times A minus over HA. So we need to rearrange this to get A minus. So A minus equals Ka times HA over H plus. Because you times both sides by HA and you divide both sides by A uh, H plus. So that gives you 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 times 0 0.1 over 8.91 times 10 to the minus 5. And that gives you a concentration of 0 0.200. Next, what we need to do is we need to work out the moles of A minus. So the moles of A minus. So um, we're adding solid sodium methanoate. So we're not adding any extra volume to this. So the volume we're going to use is still 25. So it's going to be the moles are going to be massed as uh, our concentration times volume. So that's going to be 0.200 times the uh, volume, which is 25 over 1,000. And that gives you 0 0.005 moles. And then you need to work out the MR of sodium methanoate. So because sodium methanoate has only one of these um, A minuses in them, the moles of the A minus has to equal the moles of the sodium methanoate. So therefore, the, the uh, moles of the uh, sodium methanoate, sorry, not the moles, the mass of it, sorry, is going to be moles times MR, which is 0 0.005 times its MR, which is 68, and that gives you 0 0.339, which is roughly 0 0.34 grams. A student plans an experiment to investigate the yield of propanoic acid in a sample of propanoic one oil is oxidized, and here's the, here's the thing, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They say the, student, the, the student's teacher says it's not safe. So what's going on here? We've got water in, we've got water out, we've got a bung thermometer, clamp, brown bottom glass, small glass beads, heat, and a mixture of that. So it says, give two reasons why it is not safe. Well, first of all, this flask is just floating freely. It's not clasp, uh, sorry, it's not clamped. So flask, not clamped. And um, obviously, if it's not clamped, it's just going to fall, and that's dangerous. As well as I've got a bung over here in the condenser, so there's no way for gas to escape. So if gas sort of starts rising and stuff and the reaction happens, whatever, it's just going to build up and it's going to explode. So the bung may cause an explosion. Now, I know here it says water in and water out. It's obviously wrong. That's not a safety thing. That's just not going to work properly. The experiment isn't going to put you at an increased risk of danger because of that. Give one additional reagent needed to form any propanoic acid. So this requires acidified potassium dichromate. So you need to add sulfuric acid or concentrated sulfuric acid. State two more mistakes in the way this apparatus is set up wrong. So basically, if we look here, you know, the water in and water out is obviously incorrect. It's just going to accumulate. We don't want that. So we need to change the direction of water flow. So direction of water flow through condenser. And as well as that, we don't need a thermometer. Thermometer not needed because we're not distilling here. We're just refluxing. So there's no really a point to have a thermometer in here unless, yeah.
State the purpose of the small glass beads to prevent large bubbles forming or to prevent bumping. So prevent large bubbles forming. After correcting the mistakes, the student heats a reaction mixture containing 6.5 grams of propane one all with an excess of the oxidizing agent. The propanoic acid separated from this is a mass of that. State the name of the technique used to separate propanoic acid from the reaction mixture and then calculate the percentage yield. So we're separating two organic liquids. So this is going to be distillation. And um, the in order to do this part, we need to think about what's going on here. So we've got a primary alcohol, propan propan one all, and we're adding an oxidizing agent, and then we're going to make carboxylic acid, right? So that means they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we can use this to work out our actual, you know, actual uh, yield, theoretical yield, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to first of all work out the moles of the alcohol, the propan one oh, sorry, which is going to be 6.50 divided by its MR, which I believe is 60. So that would give you, uh, let me write that out real quick. So 6.5 divided by 60 gives you 0 0.1083, blah, 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 right? Um, therefore, the moles of this carboxylic acid we want to make would also be 0 0.1083, blah, 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 because they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the mass of the COOH is going to be its moles times MR. So it's going to be 0 0.1083, blah, 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 times its MR, which I believe is 74. So if I do that times 74, we get a theoret we get a mass of 8.0167, right? So therefore, the theoretical mass is 8.0167. Now, percentage yield equals actual over theoretical times 100. The actual yield of this was 3.25. Our theoretical is 8.0167. Theoretical is what the reaction should tell you should get. Times that by 100, and let's see what we get. 40.5%, and there you go. State a single chemical test that distinguishes propanoic acid from propan one alt. So the test here is adding sodium carbonate. Why? Because the sodium carbonate will react with the acid to form CO2 gas, which then causes bubbling. And it doesn't react with propan one also no change. Okay, so now we're on to the multiple choice part. So again, you just want to kind of use process of elimination if you're stuck, or just try and work through them one by one. Basically, you've just got to try and take shortcuts, and I'll show you how I do a couple. So which does not involve the absorption of ultraviolet radiation or visible light. So the blue appearance of copper sulfate, that does require the absorption of light, because obviously, you know, the electrons move to a high state, blah, blah, blah. The breakdown of ozone in the upper atmosphere, that's free radical substitution, so it requires UV radiation. The ionization of a molecule in mass spectrometer doesn't need either of them. It needs either electrosphere ionization or electron impact, so it's got to be this one. And obviously the reaction between chlorine and methane at room temperature, that's free radical substitution, and that doesn't require, sorry, that does require UV light. Which statement about chloride ions is not correct? So they form a white precipitate with silver nitrate that's soluble in dilute aqueous ammonia. That is correct. They form an octahedral complex Sorry, an octahedral cobalt complex when aqueous cobalt ions are reacted with an excess of chloride ions. That is not correct. Because the chloride ion ligand is massive. You can't have, you know, six of them. So you can't form an octahedral complex if they only have four, so it has to be B. They form when chlorine reacts with potassium bromide solution. That is correct because it, the potassium bromide, the bromide ion get dis gets displaced by chlorine, so you get potassium chloride, so that is correct. They have an electric configuration of that. If you work by it, it's correct, so it has to be B. What is the mole fraction of a one gram co compound of relative molecular mass of this dissolved in a 30 gram of a solvent with a relative molecular mass of that? Now, we know this isn't to do with gases, but mole fraction, you can use the same principle. So mole fraction equals, you know, the moles of whatever it is you're testing over the total moles, right? So we need to work out each of the moles and the totals. So the moles of the first thing is going to be uh, 1 divided by 100, which is 0 0.01. The mole of the second thing is going to be um, 30 divided by 50, which is um, 0 0.6. So therefore, our total moles equals 0 0.61. Now, they're asking you for the mole fraction of this one gram thing, so it's going to be the moles of this thing, which is 0 0.01 over 0 0.61, which should give you 0 0.01 over 0 0.61, and that gives you 0 0.01639, but these are all in standard form, and that's the one that matches. There you go. Which one has the electric configuration of a noble gas? So just think about moving towards those noble gases on your periodic table. So obviously, if we take an electron away from that, it's not moved that way, so it's not O. Yeah, sorry, it's not H. It would only it would only apply to O if it was O2 minus, so it has to be Se2 minus, because that's the next one in group six. Which statement does not support the suggestion that an unknown organic compound is this? So we've got a um, we've got a C double bond O and an O here, so this is an ester. So we've probably got a, an alcohol that made this and a carboxylic acid that made this here, so that's helpful to always look at. So the first one says it's H and it's proton NMR spectrum has three peaks with an integration ratio of two, two, three. So there's one, two, three carbons with hydrogens on. So there's three peaks. Yeah, and they're all in different environments. And the ratio would be two to three to three because there's two here, three, three. So it's definitely that one is correct. It's carbon 13 NMR spectrum has three peaks. So there's one, two, three, four. This one still counts because it's got C double bond O. 
So it's actually got four, it's got four carbon environments. So that one is the non-correct. Um, it's infrared spectrum as an absorption to that. If you look at the data sheet, it does match that and has a 36.36 of mass of oxygen and a 9.09 uh, by mass of hydrogen. So if we work out the total MR of this, that's going to be 15 plus 12 plus 6, sorry, 15 plus 12 plus 16 plus 16 plus 14 plus 15. So it's total M uh, MR is 8 here. And if we work out the total of the oxygen here, that's going to be 16 plus 16. That's 32. And if we times that by 100, we get 36.36%. And if we do the same thing with hydrogen, it gives you the same thing. So that one is also correct. So it has to be B. Okay, so which statement about inorganic compounds is always correct? So they dissolve in water to give neutral solutions? Well, no, because there's things like ammonium and stuff like that, which can form um, basic solutions. So it's obviously not that one. And remember that like inorganic ion means it's not got carbon in. They release energy when they melt. Well, no, because when you're melting them, you're breaking bonds. So it's an endothermic process, not exothermic. So endothermic means it takes energy in. Exothermic is energy released. They contain metal cations. Um, again, not necessarily because you've got ammonium. And then um, D, they form giant structures. That is correct because they're ionic compounds. Ionic com compounds form giant ionic lattices. Okay, so which species is a lone pair of electrons in the central atom? So just look at each one and then look at the um, bonds that they have. So carbon's in group four. So one, two, three, four, and it forms up bonds of oxygen. So there's no lone pairs there. Silver's in group six. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got that bond there, that bond there. And then you've got a lone pair here. So it's that one, B. There you go. In which substance do covalent bonds break when it melts? So hexane only has van der Waals forces. If you were to break the covalent bonds, then you would have carbons and hydrogen, so it's not that. Ice has hydrogen bonds, so if you were to, it, those are being broken when you're melting it. If you were to break the covalent bonds, you'd have H and O, which is not correct. Iodine is I2, so the, it's van der Waals forces, so you're breaking those instead of the actual covalent bonds. If you break those, then you would only, if you break the covalent bonds, you'd get I and I, which is not correct. So it has to be silicon dioxide, and that makes sense because that's actually a macromolecular or giant covalent structure, so you are breaking those covalent bonds there. In which molecule are all the atoms in the same plane? So we want to look for things where we don't have like a carbon like this, for example, where, you know, you've got your three-dimensional structure like so. So we're trying to find whatever whatever has that here. So these ones straight off the bat, you can sort of rule out. Next, we've got C6H5Cl. So the benzene ring itself is planar. It's in one plane and Cl like that. So it has to be C. The reason it's not D is because if we look at D like this, it's got a methyl group, but that methyl group is three-dimensional. It's not planar. So it's not D. 15 is C. Okay, so which molecule is a permanent dipole? So the way I like to think of it is imagine we've got B and then we've got F and we've got F and we've got F. If it's a symmetrical molecule, all the dipoles cancel out because the more electronegative thing will pull the electrons towards itself. So for example, I like to think of it as three things pulling on this equally. If they're all pulling on it equally in all directions, then the B's not moving anywhere, so there's no overall dipole. If you look at NH3, its structure is this. And that's not symmetrical. You can see that the electrons are being pulled up this way. So there is a permanent dipole, therefore it's B. And in regards to SO3, sorry, you can treat double bonds as one, one pair of electrons when it comes to shapes, and you'd find that it's also symmetrical, and this is symmetrical too. Which statement about CH3, 2CH, CH2, COH is correct? So this is a complex of a gas. So let's have a look what's going on here. So in aqueous solution, it reacts with magnesium to form carbon dioxide. That is not correct. If it reacts with the magnesium carbonate, it could. It's the carbonate part that leads to the production of CO2, not the not the actual presence of carbon in the acid itself, because what you're implying is that this acid gives off CO2 from itself and loses the CO2, which is not correct. So it's definitely not that. They can form hydrogen bonds. I mean, that's correct. It's got an OH there. A mixture of two decimeter cubed of hydrogen and one decimeter cubed of oxygen at room temperature, which statement is correct? There's no reaction to form water because the molecules do not collide with sufficient energy. I mean, that looks correct so far. We'll stick with that. There's no reaction to form water because the molecules do not collide with sufficient frequency. That's not correct. It doesn't matter about how frequent they are. They need to have enough energy to do that. The mean velocity of the hydrogen molecules is less than that of the oxygen molecules. I mean, that depends on temperature, so no. And the partial pressure of each gas is the same, no, because there's different volumes of them. So it has to be A. Which statement about the distribution of a curve of molecular energy is an ideal gas at given temperature? So they're talking about your Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. Just a quick reminder, this is kind of what it looks like. See, it levels off here. It starts at zero, zero because no molecules have zero energy. And I mean, well, there you go. That's your answer there. The curve is symmetrical about the maximum, not really. They're always skewed a little bit depending on what the temperature is. Changing the temperature has no effect on the position of the maximum. That is untrue because if you turn, if you increase the temperature, it stretches to the right. And if you decrease it, it stretches to the left. And most molecules have the mean energy is also incorrect. The mean actually lies more towards the side of where you find most of the molecules. Reason being is because if you have a standard bell curve like this, then the, where you find the most of the mean is right in the middle. But because it's stretched a little bit, the mean is actually a bit to the right. Which statement about the addition of a catalyst to an equilibrium mixture is correct? So the activation energy of the reverse reaction increases? No, because it catalyst it, um, accelerates the rate of reaction of both the forward and reverse reactions. And the reason it does that is because it provides an alternate reaction route with a lower activation energy. 
So it's definitely not that. The equilibrium constant for the forward reaction increases. It's not that because the, both the forward and reverse reactions are um, increased. So there's no overall change in equilibrium position. And also as well as that, the only thing that affects the equilibrium constant is temperature. Nothing else changes it because they all balance out to give you the same KC, KA, KW value. So it's only temperature that affects that. The rate of the reverse reaction increases is correct because it does it for both the forward and reverse. And the enthalpy change of the forward reaction decreases is no, it doesn't affect that. The reason the enthalpy change doesn't change is because enthalpy, Hess's law says that as long as you start at the same point and end at the same point, the enthalpy change is always the same. So for example, if this is your house and that's Tesco one mile away, if you go from your house to Tesco, that's one mile. If you go all the way to Australia and back to Tesco, you're still one mile away from your house. All the catalyst does is it provides an alternate reaction route, but the start and finish are the exact same. So the enthalpy change is always the same as well. Which equation does not show the reduction of a transition metal? So we've got Ti, and this is the oxidation state of this is 4 plus, and it's going to uh, 0, so it's definitely not that one, because that one's being reduced. This one's 3 plus, and it's going to 2 plus, so that's being reduced. This one's going from um, 4 plus to um, 2 plus, so that one's also being reduced, so it has to be B. And if you look at that, that's plus 2 to plus 4, so that is being oxidized. Which substance contains delocalized electrons? No, because that's, an alk that's a um, co simple covalent molecule. Graphite does. Iodine doesn't, and neither does sodium chloride. So yeah, there you go. Okay, so which one has EZ isomers? So you need to look at which... So basically, each carbon needs to have two different groups, like so. It doesn't matter if you have X and... Like, for example, X and Y, right? It doesn't matter if you have them on the... Like, if you have two Xs, but they have to be on opposite sides. Each carbon has to have two different groups, and that's how you get EZ isomerism. So if you look at this first one here, the carbon on the left has two hydrogens, so it can't be EZ isomerism. Um, if we look at B, uh, the carbon on the right has two bromines, so it can't be that one either because there's two different ones, sorry, two same ones. If we look at C, we've got a CH and we've got a BR, and then we've got a CH and a BR, so it has to be C. And it can't be D because, you know, two same groups here, so it's not that either. Which polymer has hydrogen bonding between the polymer chains? So unfortunately, it's one of those things we have to just memorize the structures of them. It's, it's Kevlar because it's got those C double bond O-N bonds. Polyvinyl chloride doesn't have any NHs. Poly, polyphenyl ethene doesn't have any NHs or OHs. Uh, and terylene, I had to look that one up. That one doesn't have any NHs or OHs in it. So it has to be Kevlar because that's the only one that has an NH in it, which can form hydrogen bonds. Okay, so which compound needs the greatest amount of oxygen for the complete combustion of one mole of the compound? So the way I like to see this is, right, if you've got your substance plus some amount of O2, it gives you CO2 plus H2O for all of these, you know, carbon and hydrogen co containing compounds. So first of all, we, we need to try and find out what has the most carbon and the least oxygen on this side so that we keep adding more of this O2, right? So we can already rule out ethane 1,2-dial because that's got two oxygen, so that's going to re require less oxygen to do. So it's not going to be that one. And it ain't going to be methanol either because it's only one carbon. So now we need to compare between ethanol and ethanol. So ethanol is this, and ethanol is that. So you need to compare the two of these. now. This one has an extra H here that needs combusting as well to make another H2O. So this one's going to require more oxygen. So it's going to be ethanol. Which compound is produced when one phenyl ethanol reacts with acidified potassium dichromate? So let's just have a quick sketch of what's going on here. So we've got we've got a phenyl group here and we've got ethanol here. So it's going to have an O and it's going to have an H, 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 H like that, and H, right? So that's that's what we've got going on here. So if we're adding it with acidified, if we're adding acidified potassium dichromate, it's going to form something with a C double bond O here, not a carboxylic acid because there's not enough you know space for it to have that. So we need to basically pick out whichever one does that. So automatically we can rule out this one, and we can rule out this one because that's on the wrong carbon. Uh, we can rule out this one because that's not got a double bond O, so it has to be C, because you can see that's the it's on the right carbon. It's supposed to be on this carbon here where the phenyl group is attached, and that's what that this carbon has that phenyl group attached, and that C double bond O, and then the CH3 next to it says do that one, it says C. Which is the correct general formula for non cyclic compounds in the homologous series? So, what you can do is you can draw just like one or two quick alcohols, aldehydes, and esters, and then add a CH2 onto it, and then you'll be able to work out, you know, which one it is. In this case, it's alcohols. Reason being is because in a homologous series, each individual um, increases by CH2. Which compound forms a white precipitate when added to aqueous silver nitrate? So we're looking for whatever has chloride in it, which is this one. Okay, so nitration of 1.7 grams of methyl benzoate produces this, all right, and the percentage of that. So we're in the one-to-one -one ratio, so we need to quickly grind out a percentage of calculation. So at the moles at the start is going to be 1.70 over 136, which is um, 1.7 over 136, which is 0 0.0125 moles. Now, because they react in a one-to-one -one ratio, the moles of this should also be... 0 
So therefore, the mass of the product we want is going to be it times its MR. So that's going to be 0 0.0125 times the MR of the product, which is 181. So we do that. And we should get 2.2625. So that's our theoretical. So percentage yield equals the actual of your theoretical. And what do they want us? To, they want us to find out the actual. So the percentage yield times the theoretical gives us the actual. So that's going to be the percentage yield is 0 0.65 times your answer, which gives us 1.47065. So there you go. It's there. Okay, so a two-step preparation of propylamine has shown what is X. So we're going from bromomethane to propylamine. So we're extending the carbon chain. So automatically, we're probably going to be using a cyanide ion here. So automatically, we can think the intermediate is going to have to have a CN in it. So it's B. If we were to do nucleophilic substitution directly, this wouldn't give us that extra carbon because it's propyl now from ethan. So we would end up with ethanamine, not propylamine. So it's just really important to be careful with that. Which compound reacts with warm dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide? So that's just benzene, so no, it does not. Um, this one's just an alkene, so no, it does not. This is just an amine, it does not. Um, it has to be this one. And I mean, also, ethanoic anhydride does react with sodium hydroxide, so there you go. Okay, so methylamine reacts with bromamine by a nucleophilic substitution reaction to produce a mixture of products. What's a not, not a possible product of this reaction? So what we need to do is just quickly sketch out what's going on here. So we've got methylamine, so that's going to be HHH here, and then we've got an N with a double bond here, sorry, double bond, lone pair there, and, and that's what we've got. And what we're adding is we're doing nucleophilic substitution with bromoethane. So one, two, HHH, BR, HH. So what we're doing in this substitution is we're swapping the BR for this, right? So what happens is this group attaches onto here. So what we end up with is CC, HHH, HH, and then an N with a lone pair here, and then your H3C. We can't add more H3Cs on, because that's not what substitutes, it's this bromine that substitutes. So what you can do is you can replace this with a C, a C and an H, and an H like this as well. And in theory as well, you could also do it, you could also do this as well, C, C, H, 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 H as well, and that becomes a plus. So we can't add any more of the methyls on, so we need to find out whichever one does that, because that's not what's being substituted, it's the BR that's being substituted. So if we look at that, that has to be C, because you can see they've swapped out some of the um, the hydrogen atoms on the N with CH3s, which doesn't happen. That's not what's being, that's not what's being, um, you can't substitute it with itself. Which is a repeating unit of a polyamide. So when you're looking for a polyamide, what you're looking for is a C double bond O, N, H. That's a peptide link or an amide link. So there's no amide link here, there's no amide link here, there's no amide link here, and bang, it's right there. There you go, B. That's why it's really important to be able to recognize organic groups by the group CC. So for example, if you see a COOH, you should be able to say, oh, that's a carboxylic acid group. So it's just really important to keep that in mind. Which type of polymer is not hydrolyzed by heating with concentrated aqueous sodium hydroxide? It's polyalkene, all the other ones do. Okay, so what's the structure of azwitterine over amino acid? So just as a reminder of amino, amino acid, you've got a CH, you've got an R group there, you've got an NH3, and then you've got a HOOC here, carboxylic group, right? So now, when it forms a zwitteri, and that becomes um, COO minus on that side, and that becomes NH4 plus. So we need to find out whichever one has a COO minus and a one NH4 plus. So that one is D, because you can see you've got your R group here, you've got your H there, and you've got your COO minus and NH3 plus. That's the only one that fits that. So there you go. And then which row shows a bare pace that can link two strands of DNA through hydrogen bonds? If you use the data sheet, you can find that is C. Thank you very much for watching. I'm sorry that at the end it got a bit rushed. My uh, recording just disappeared for some reason, so I had to kind of zoom through it a little bit just because I'm short on time. Thank you very much. You know the drill, like, share, subscribe, all of the usual. And yeah, thank you.